Welcome to Emerging Franchise Brands, the podcast that introduces you to the visionary founders of America's fastest growing franchise opportunities. We'll also hear from industry pros as they share insights on what it really takes to achieve the elusive milestone of 100 plus locations. I am your host, Frank Fumi, founder of i9 Sports, and my 20 year journey from inception to acquisition has given me a unique perspective on how to succeed in franchising. Join me as we welcome today's guest. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast. On today's show, I have a very special guest. I have Edith Wiseman, president of Fran Data. Edith, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> I like that. Very nice. I caught that. Very, very cool. I haven't heard that one yet. <laughs> we do everything, Fran. <laughs> very, very nice. Edith, I, I am super excited to have you on the show. So, you know, our audience is a mix of, obviously, our theme is about, of course, emerging franchises. And I think our audience is sort of a mix of founders that they have brands that have already started and they're grinding and trying to get to becoming established. We have people who are even just trying to start franchising their concept. And then, of course, we have people who are looking to invest in franchising. You're the first person I've brought on that is uh, data-driven and I love your company and I think Fran Data is one of the most important organizations in our industry and it's a pleasure to have you on the show. So, uh, so let's get started. First off, share with the audience a little bit about what Frandata is, what Frandata does for, for franchisors. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Um, so we're fundamentally a market research company, but like, what does that mean? Um, that means that we are information and data driven. So we collect information exclusively on franchise franchises across 30 years, across 200 and subsectors. And um, we have information expertise that fuels our ability to help answer franchisor questions. So very franchise specific issues. And then we also use that same information to credit risk rate every single franchise, uh, which allows a, a lender who is financing a franchisee to pull down a credit score and to be able to assess should they lend to a particular franchise or not, and if so, um, at what terms. Uh, along that line, um, especially for emerging brands who they can't be credit scored, uh, we've created a certification of uh, franchise eligibility for the SBA lending program that lenders just download and it goes into their file so they know that they don't have to worry about SBA saying you didn't do it right. And then finally, we have a, a database of franchise owners that represents about a half million businesses um, that franchisors and suppliers use to access to get directly in contact with other franchise owners for purposes of either developing a franchise grow or for selling them services. So bottom line, we help franchise companies grow and just basically all companies grow in franchising with these services. Mm. I remember back when I started my franchise, I was so overwhelmed with the amount of resources. You know, you show up to your first IFA and first of all, you're in, you're in awe, right? You have all these brands, you have all these vendors and suppliers and you walk the trade show booths and you don't even know who to work with and what to ask. And you kind of just kind of hit in the face with everything. I think that Fran Data, uh, as well known as it is, of course, as an established or mature franchise brand, somebody that's new starting out. If I was looking to franchise my company, I typically use one of the consultants, right? To help franchise, I get a franchise attorney, I get an FDD done. But I think where most emerging franchise or founders are missing that gap is where do I identify the right strategy or growing my franchise, in developing my brand. And I'd like for you to talk a little more about what Fran Data can really do to help, besides the financing side of things, what can Fran Data do to help me as a founder? I'm trying to establish my brand. It's interesting. I'm contacted by companies that are looking to franchise. And we're not a franchise development company in the sense that like that's the thing that we do. But what I hear from these franchisors, like you said, they're very overwhelmed by 
who to talk to, are they the right services? And I kind of counsel them just to like stop and take a step back. And, you know, everybody thinks their business is amazing and that it's franchisable. But the first thing they need to realize is that they're going to be one of thousands of brands. We, in our business, we have a, a, a service that's called the New Concept Report. And in the last year, we found 450 new concepts. Now, I would actually venture that that number is significantly higher than that because these are only franchise brands that come into our purview. And we know that we don't have 100% fill rate in terms of every single company that started franchising. What I see is that People don't really know, okay, how are they going to differentiate themselves in this sea of opportunities? I had a, 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 a series of conversations with multi-unit franchise owners who, um, who said, yeah, there's just a lot of emerging brands out there and they're all going to grow to a thousand units. <laughs> and it's like, so, so what, what a franchise or first has to understand is, so looking at their financial picture of what they offer, like how does that compare to others in the market that prospective franchisees might be looking into? Because if that isn't at least on par or better than what's available, it's going to be a tough row to hoe <laughs> to mm -hmm. get people interested um, in, in your concept. So I think having a full understanding of that unit PNL competitive to, to what else is in the marketplace. And then as I alluded with this conversation I had with the multi operators is we did a study with the international franchise association on emerging brands, like what are their needs and what are their challenges and their expectations? And I tell you that it is was kind of shocking to me that almost every emerging brand that we talked to had completely unrealistic expectations in terms of their growth potential and how fast they would grow. Mm. So like we're talking very far away from reality. So the other thing that, you know, that the great thing about franchising is, is that there are companies that have done this before. Mm -hmm. And so I always recommend to people first understand what is realistic in terms of your one, your two, your three, your four growth potential. And you're likely not the first brand that has ever come to market mm -hmm. in your category or similar. So we can actually track back to year one, year two, year three, and see how fast brands have grown. Because most of the time, even those brands that got to 100 units in a short period of time, mm -hmm. it took them a few years to actually get some momentum to be able to get to 100 units. So it looks like they were an overnight success, but actually they had a few fits and starts before they could get there. Right. I definitely relate to that. I think we were more like a 15 year overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we almost went out of business within two years. We burned through cash like crazy. We survived it. We fixed everything. And thank goodness we did when we did because the recession was like two years after that. If we had not repaired our company and made all those fixes and changes to training and support and right staffing, we, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation right now. My company would never have lasted. Interesting. I never really thought as a new franchise concept, looking at a new concept report to really see comparing myself to what other new concepts are doing and how they're set up. I think when you're a founder, right, when you're starting out, whatever sector that is, you go right to who are the other major players. And then you try to compare yourself to them and what they're offering, but that's not really apples to apples. There, it's a helpful guide. So you're right. Um, it isn't apples to apples because their growth rate's going to be far exceed yours. Right. Uh, because they've got the tools in place. What is useful is actually taking those companies and looking back, right? So let's say, for instance, you're starting a uh, kid's sports franchise mm -hmm. um, and you could actually look back and see, okay, how fast did you guys grow? Right. You know, back in the day, uh, just as a benchmark, a reality check, because most of these projections and, and the subsequent support costs that come along with the projected growth is 
unrealistic. So like you might be thinking you've got to spend more money to support growth that you're not going to realize or that, you know, I, I, I spent some time with a, a burger franchise in Manhattan who she had, you know, spent $150,000 to like develop an FDD, develop her program. And I think she ultimately ended up selling two or three locations. And, you know, she, when I sat down with her and I said, you know, what do you think went wrong? She was like, I didn't spend enough time with a, like a marketing company to figure out how to differentiate my business to, to a prospective owner, because I just came across as just like another burger brand. And so, you know, beyond these things, like, do you have a competitive financial, like um, business in a box to offer someone mm -hmm. um, and projecting realistic growth and projecting realistic cost structure to go along with that is this other component piece, which is, are you different? Like, you know, it, do will consumers, both prospective franchisees and consumers, will it resonate, uh, your business resonate? And how do you get through that crowded, the crowded noise? Mm. So yeah, the crowded noise uh, is something that I actually wrote this down. I want to get your thoughts on how, how does a franchise brand that is emerging stay ahead of the competition and kind of break through the market? So I think it depends on their, on the life cycle. So when brands are really young and just starting out new, it, like there's, there's, I, I have to put emerging brands into different buckets. So there's emerging brands who let's say they have one or two locations and they're really bootstrapping their franchising efforts because there's not enough, what we call like recurring revenue to support. So for those brands, they have to go slow and be very thoughtful about their first partners. And it, it should really be like in their network. The reason why I say that is because their, their cost of failure could bring down their whole business, right? Because one or two locations, they might have financed getting franchising started. So they're already kind of in debt and behind the eight ball in terms of having capital to like support a growth story. So like proving out that there's like someone owning the business can be replicated versus like a, a business that has 10 to 20 corporate locations. So that type of emerging brand has the recurring revenue that comes from corporate locations to be able to, to, to baby acquire, go a little bit faster to be able to spend on things like hiring a full-time franchise salesperson and maybe hiring outsource resources like PR to like help generate for, for lead development. So to me, these, these are kind of different profiles of emerging brands. Mm -hmm. When it comes to, um, I've kind of got lost. You like what your question? I was so focused on making sure I differentiated who's who. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm trying to figure out, like, okay, an emerging brand. But you're right. There's an there are emerging brands. They're trying to break out of this crowded market. That's that yes. you know that exists, right? How do they how do they get ahead of the competition? But it sounds like what you're saying is, of course, they they're coming a couple of flavors, right? I have the one franchise system that's that they're growing onesie twosie. They are slow and steady, and then we have the folks that do have a considerable number of corporate owned locations. They have the cash flow. They can put the pedal to the metal a little bit. I assume what you're trying to say is they're spending more money on marketing. They have the access to capital to be able to try to grow. So you, yes. are you saying really you need to stay in your lane basically? Yeah. Well, so getting back to your question, how do you differentiate? And so I, I think of these things as, okay, so from a franchise development standpoint, how do you differentiate? For a smaller brand, you have to differentiate what your strength is, is that you are the founder, you are the person who's going to be working with them. And you're going to do slow growth because you are personally invested in someone's success. And so you're not going to be someone who's going to quickly get run over because of fast growth or, you know, unrealistic expectations of maybe other brands. So I would lever, like kind of localize the franchise development effort be one on one with the person who's who's going to grow. Mm -hmm. And so to me, then then you're building like the very solid foundation. 
versus a brand that has 10, 20 units, they have a solid foundation. So from that standpoint, they can lever off the fact that like, we've proven this out across multiple geographies. Mm -hmm. So to your point, they can grow faster and then they have financials to demonstrate. I looked at a, an emerging brand in one of our new concept reports, just randomly first one, and it's uh, uh, in the medical uh, field and they're generating four plus million dollars per location for all of their like 11 corporate stores. I mean, that's a very different value proposition. Mm -hmm. So that particular uh, type of profile of a franchisor can, they can make a difference by saying, look at our experience, look at the bench strength of our executive team, right. you know, look what infrastructure we have. So these, these two should be going to market differently. Mm -hmm. True. I want to go back to expectations, though, of these emerging franchises. So I've probably interviewed between 70 and 80 people since wow. the end of July, right? We released our first Amazing. episode September 2023, but we started recording at the end of July. It definitely ranges from folks that are saying, hey, slow and steady. I'm okay with having two, three. I want to have 10 next year. I've had other people who are saying, I have three open. I have 200 in development. And by the time that podcast airs, they're talking about maybe having 300 open. So it runs the gamut. I hear only the anecdotal stories. I don't have the data to support this, but it does sound like franchisors, we're in this new golden age of selling franchises, maybe because of the FSOs and the brokers. But I don't mean to sound so old from back in way back in 2003, but way back in 2003, it didn't happen like that. And I feel like there are so many brands that they are selling an enormous amount of locations. And is it just me with anecdotal stories or are we in this new golden age of selling a mass amount of locations that are in development, but not open? What do you think? Does the data support that? So there is a gap in terms of data that is not reportable. Meaning the data that we gather is the number of units that are opened mm -hmm. and those that are projected to open and the number of agreements that are signed. Sales is a totally different thing. So I can sell 10 locations, right? So I remember there's an emerging brand in my market that's in the dry cleaning business and they sold a hundred unit development agreement in the West Coast. That never has to be reported anywhere unless it's on a press release. Mm -hmm. So the actual number of sold is a mystery in our industry. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, so the question of how many sold actually get opened is actually a question that people have asked us, mm -hmm. um, but there's no real data to support what that answer is. When say a bank or a, uh, a, a franchisee comes to me and they say, oh, uh, you know, I'm looking at this franchise and they've got 200 locations. And I look up on their website and I'm like, there's two, or I look in our database and there's two. I say, okay, let's think about this. They have the promise of 230. And if mm -hmm. you have two, would that scare you? Yeah. I mean, it scares me yeah. because it, it tells me that they have emphasized selling mm -hmm. and not opening. So as a, as a, as a prospective franchise owner, I would pause, I would pause and say, okay, where am I in that 230? <laughs> Like, <laughs> where, how important am I going to be sure. if I'm number 231? Um, you right. know, probably not particularly important because they're going to they're going to have to focus on getting these 230 open. Right. So they've got obligations that are outstanding. Mm -hmm. The other thing is from a, an emerging brand perspective, I hear emerging brands, they seem very cavalier in the way they say like, oh, if a, someone doesn't open, it's like, oh, it's non-refundable. That money's gone, mm -hmm. right? Like if they sold it to a broker, for instance, um, they have to pay the broker. And so that money is gone. They can't refund it. So one of the issues when Quiznos grew very quickly is their fees were non-refundable. And guess what happened? 
enough people got together and said, hey, this isn't right. I just paid you whatever at the time. At the time, it was 25000 These days, initial franchise fees are higher. Right. So let's say they're 50000 I paid you $50,000 for the pleasure of nothing. <laughs> Exactly. It, it's funny you mentioned Quiznos because as you were talking earlier, my mind immediately went to Quiznos and I remember all of the, the, the bad press. I mean, it was uh, rightfully so, but I thought of Quiznos right away. That's a great example of a concept that sold a ton of franchises and how many of them did not open. And, and it's not for... I remember this back in the day, people were looking for locations. They just couldn't find locations. Right. And if they found a location, it wasn't necessarily getting approved. So you have these things that are outside of a franchisee's control mm -hmm. to getting open. And then the franchisor says, no, I'm not going to refund you. Doesn't seem right. So here's what I would say is the emphasis on selling needs to be tempered a bit with the emphasis on viability to open, right? So like, let's not get people into training and signing franchise agreements if we know they're not gonna be able to get financing, mm -hmm. right? Like you're just causing not only yourself headache, potential lawsuits, legal fees, but you're also creating potential issues with franchising, right? You right. Know? Like legislation, like this stuff boils up eventually. It mm -hmm. might take some time, but it does. Uh, so kind of slow down the process to making sure you're getting people to, are they going to get financing? If they don't get financing, then they should be able to get their franchise fee back, mm -hmm. right? Because these are things that these should be predicated on checking certain boxes. Now, someone failing training, like, okay, that's their problem. <laughs> like, right. So, you know, um, but, but things that are not within the franchisee's control should not be puts a franchisee out of certain funds that they would have maybe promised or, or delivered. Totally. I agree. Could you picture like I'm an emerging franchise founder. I want to grow and I, I do all the legwork to finally get a broker group excited about us, which we know is a new concept. It, it can be a challenge, right? And you go through educating the broker group and then you're saying, okay, well, somebody needs to sell these franchises. I talk with all the FSOs. I find one, I connect with them. Now, isn't the pressure on me because I agree with what you're saying. Basically, you're saying don't open more than I can handle and support, train and support. At the same time, I'm tempering this relationship with the brokers that are saying go, 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 and the FSO saying I've got these great candidates. How I balance that is, is, is a very delicate balance between keeping yeah. my broker FSO relationships happy mm -hmm. and opening enough because it's kind of exciting to get people interested in buying your franchise and it's hard to tell right. people no, especially even if they're the right people. So mm -hmm. I, I see where the challenge lies and maybe that's what's happening right now in the marketplace. Uh, and maybe the data says otherwise, but are, are we seeing more franchises being sold and in development and opening now more than they had been in the past, say five years, say, say pre COVID. So I think what we do know is that the franchise industry has matured. So what that means is you now have like second generation franchisees or second generation of people who, you know, are getting their kids involved in the franchise industry. To me, what we're seeing is you're just seeing a more expertise. So people have been doing this for a long time mm -hmm. and then they're starting up companies. So to your point, like there's more franchise sales organizations. Why is that? Well, because there's more people with that skill set who are available who say, I'm going to go out and start my own business and develop this service that I know I can do better and I can service more brands. So you just have more access to people with talent mm -hmm. than you might have maybe 20 years ago. You know, I, I, I say that franchising is ubiquitous now, and I mean that in every sense of the word, when I have a neighbor who is a shelf genie franchisee. I have another neighbor who is a sign franchisee, you know, and then everywhere I go, I have people like taxi cab drivers and you name it. The moment mm -hmm. I say what I do, it's like, you know, I get stopped in a, in the airport by a guy, a guy in the lending industry, like what franchise should I buy? I'm getting picked <laughs> up on LinkedIn. My husband's sending me all of his LinkedIn messages about <laughs> how he should buy a franchise. 
Um, no, he shouldn't. Right. <laughs> right. I'm kidding. He'd be a great franchisee. <laughs> but the point is, it's 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 everywhere mm -hmm. um, because the, the industry has matured. There's more services to help fuel the effort of franchise development. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why you're seeing so much more ability for franchisors to grow quickly because there are more prospects who are aware of franchising. There's more services to get it in front of prospects and there's more talent to like convert. Let's move on to trends here for a moment. What's exciting to you right now about franchising as an industry? What's good? What's good is I have seen it over and over again, be successful for franchisors and for franchisees uh, that are are partnered together. So uh, the thing that I was last year really emphasizing is I do think that this evolution of uh, franchising has happened where you've got this greater amount of talent that has evolved. Uh, plus you have franchisees that are getting bigger, right? You've mm -hmm. got franchisees that also have uh, grown over time and now you've attracted bigger money into franchising. What I think we will see is an evolution of the franchise model because you have very large, well-heeled franchisees. You have franchisors that are also franchisees. Mm -hmm. You have suppliers that are also franchisees. And so you have pe people that have previously been distinctly on separate sides, right? Like I'm a franchisee, you're a franchisor. Right. But now if you're a franchisee and franchisor, like you kind of have to see a little bit more in the middle. So I think there may be some refining of the model, like kind of those rough edges getting mm -hmm. smoothed out because people have different interests, but also similar interests by being on both sides of the table. In the past, you were either a franchisor or a franchisee. And I do, I, I've noticed that the last couple of meetings that I've been to, hearing of other franchise leaders that are also franchisees of concepts. I don't remember that when I was starting out. Yeah. Even suppliers, right? So right. I met with a guy who's a private equity executive and he owns two other franchises and I, a private equity company that is a franchisor and a franchisee of the concept that they're a franchisor of. And then you have companies like you know, Marcos and Little Caesars who encourage their executives to also be franchisees. That's brilliant. So it's, I do, I, I feel like there's this, this dynamic can't help, but kind of take those issues that sometimes arise in the relationship that cause friction and, sure. and help come up with creative solutions because of it. Okay. I like that. What worries you or what is something you're concerned about right now in franchising? So I love that franchising has always been something where someone who wouldn't otherwise open a business, uh, franchising allows them to be a business owner mm -hmm. because there's more structure, there's a process, there's a formula, there's collaboration, there's networking, there's, there's together growth, there's parallel growth. So all of that to me is very exciting. The thing that's concerning is that as costs rise, right? So inflation, the cost of franchise fees are going up and everybody is like that, the accessibility of going from, you know, not, not having uh, maybe a huge nest egg and being able to, to create a nest egg uh, through franchising. I, I fear that is that, is that diminished? Has that been diminished? with the evolution of just the competitive nature of, of the marketplace that franchisors want to go after um, experienced operators. They want to go after people who have capital, right? Because they're going to be able to withstand the, the storms and be able to deal with the inflationary pressures. Right. So that from a, from a macro perspective, I just don't want the, the dream of you know, I had a colleague who who started up a business in her home and she's now a very successful multi-unit franchisee. Like that is what I, I fear and that may be diminishing a little bit. So it's a more sophisticated buyer. That's I think that's where most franchisors have turned their attention to. Sure. Because that is who can bring capital to the table. They're, you know, banks want to lend to people who have money, right? <laughs> right. 
we started to see that over the last decade, I, the people that came forward really that were most interested were more sophisticated buyers, which I always attributed to how great that is for our brand, that we're attracting people that were more sophisticated. At the same time, we were also seeing, and we see now more than ever, the baby boomer parent right buying or the, or the Gen X parent buying a franchise for their Gen Z kid. Does data support that? We've we absolutely see that. Um, so we profile the franchise owners. Are they an influencer within the system? And like, what's their background? And so you do see uh, like larger franchisee operators and their kid is invested in another brand. So for instance, uh, there was a franchisee of Domino's who I was looking at and very large franchisee within Domino's and her son uh, invested in a salad concept. So you definitely see these, I mean, I think in that instance, it's it's someone who is in franchising already versus a uh, the, the different circumstance where someone is becoming a franchisee for the first time and their, their parents are financing that. Mm. But we're seeing both. I wonder if there's data to support on the success of a franchisee if it was bought for them versus them scrounging the dollars or getting financing on their own. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> we we don't track that um, that information, but right. it's a good question. I, I had a, a girlfriend in uh, college. Her brother, um, her dad bought her brother a restaurant, and um, you're like, well, where's their skin in the game? Unless they have some skin in the game, um, I question their their ability to, to, uh, to ultimately be successful. Yeah. I, I've seen a, I saw a mix of both. We tend to easily gravitate to the negative story. Oh, it doesn't work because they didn't have skin in the game. I experienced some very, very successful parent child franchise opportunities together where, you know, the mom or dad invested in their son or daughter and they did really, really well. But there was also cases where the mom and dad also were involved. Like they helped mentor their kid because they had ex mm -hmm business experience, if they just said, hey, I'm buying my, I'm just writing the check and giving my kid money. Those seem to be a little more of a challenge, but I think when the parents were a little bit more involved, it seemed to have helped. If I were ever to do that, I would do it under an earn out, right? Mm -hmm. so parents own it and the kid has the ability to earn it out through performance. So it the, the kid doesn't feel like they own it, but they have to work to own it. Um, I want to move on to something else that's kind of been near and dear to my heart. And I want to get your take on it, Edith. So yes. I have very mixed feelings about this enormous influx of PE firms involved in franchising. I see the pluses and minuses of it. And I feel like, okay, so I left my company, you know, over the last few years, but I, I wasn't totally involved in, in the industry. And then when I kind of came back and I was kind of floored by how much the influence of PE has been, even like in the last five years, like a lot, right? They're, they seem to have, they seem to be everywhere and touching everything in franchising. And now in interviewing people and talking to other franchise leaders and going to some of their conferences, I see the pluses and minuses to it. I have a lot of mixed feelings about it on, I know there's good players and bad players, but overall, what are your, what are your thoughts on it? So there are absolutely good players and bad players. I've talked to franchisors who have had a PE as franchise involvement in the franchisee mm -hmm. and had an incredibly horrible experience. And they have banned PE ownership of franchisees because of it. I do think it's ironic that there are some PE firms that own a franchisor and have bid on franchisees but won't allow PE ownership within their franchisee system. So, right. So imagine we know that they've bid on a franchisee. Right. They lost. Now they own a franchisor and now they won't allow ownership of PE firms within their franchisee organization. So it's a little, it's interesting to say, okay, why, why is that? Mm -hmm. um, and I think in part, when you're a franchisee, you get access to all the information, right? right? So if a PE firm wants to sell, they might not want to give their secret sauce or their information to another PE firm that could be a potential buyer or is networked with other PE firms. Mm -hmm. So there might be like a confidentiality reason, but it just 
it makes me chuckle. Right, <laughs> so, right. Irony. Um, so on the on the plus side, a lot of times PE comes in and they professionalize the business. So oftentimes the first thing that they're doing is evaluating what can be um can be optimized. So are there technology? Is there support? Um, so to me, a PE firm that comes in is and is investing in the business, mm -hmm. that's a good PE partner. So they're thinking about it the right way versus a PE firm that is coming in and just trying to drive return. And so they're cutting costs. They're, you know, degraded. Ultimately, you know, we've seen this in food service where the multiple cases of this where a PE firm comes in and it just drives the business into the ground because mm -hmm. they're just trying to maximize returns during their ownership and not thinking about building the business. A PE firm that is investing and building the foundation and, and really bringing in management that might be able to help scale the business. And yes, they're all focused on growth in a more accelerated manner than maybe a, just a business, a traditional business owner or a like most franchise companies and franchisees are family owned businesses. Right. So, so there's a different like cadence in terms of growth uh, expectations and capabilities. So what PE firms bring is the capability to grow. The downside is that when that growth is not achieved, growth needs to be achieved. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, I like how you said that. So they're going to find it one way or the other. Right. And it may come at the expense of franchisees in a different way. Right. So from the supply chain, from something else. And so that's where I think that PE can be destructive is if they're leveraging that fr franchise relationship for growth without it being mutual growth. Right. So I think of win-win is mutual growth. The franchisor sure. and the franchisee are growing together in some form or fashion. Yeah. I really caution new founders that think this is the holy grail. I need to be part of a platform that they're starting out because this PE firm offered me the moon and stars and I don't have to do any work. I'm just going to get X percent of the company and I can just do some training and, and they built this up and they have a dream. They had this vision of exactly what they want to do, but they thought this is like the easy way out. Like there is no such thing as an easy way out, right? Uh, I don't know. I don't know of any business where it's just, you just turn it over to somebody and they're going to grow it. But I, I agree with you that PE firms have brought a level of sophistication and professionalizing if you have the right one, right? Because they're, I, I, I can tell you from my experience, so I have two PE experiences and my first one was with a company um, out of Virginia and they were, they were terrific, but we were already established. And they basically came in and said, guys, we know that you know what you're doing. You have a great leadership team. We just want to help support you. So we're here to help you. And they did really just that. Like they, they basically left us alone and they knew what we were doing. They made it very clear. Look, we're going to keep you for X number of years or until the EBITDA hits a certain number. And then we're going to sell you. But that's what we do. It's part of our fund. And we knew we had expectations. But I hear of other founders that, go into a PE firm, uh, become part of this platform of a private equity firm, and they're starting out like they have no franchise, they're not established. And that really concerns me because A, you don't know if it's going to be a churn and burn and they're going to turn this thing over. Like, is that how you want your story to end? Because that's potentially the risk involved is that your fairy tale ending sucked because mm -hmm. you got wooed by these potential dollars early on. Yeah, I think what you said on both the franchisor and the franchisee side is that there is no easy way. Like in yeah. either case, franchising is not an ATM machine. So, um, <laughs> yes. so right. I think that it can make sense for some for some brands. There are companies. So I've seen PE firms that have purchased a, a brand that's very small, or they they franchise them because they're trying to build out a platform. And if the PE firm is the right PE firm and they are investing and and you see it throughout the, the business, they're investing in people, like at the franchisor level, 
the culture, they're, they're investing in systems, then that business that they would convert into a franchise has the support and the executive team has longevity. Like there's, if you have, if you can check all those boxes, then there's, there is potential for, for a really good story, but everybody's doing it right now. Right. And if there, there's, there's a lot at risk if those, all those boxes aren't checked. What's been, uh, what's been your biggest surprise in franchising, Edith? I guess what's been surprising to me is the amount of, of legislative and regulatory pushback on franchising. When I've talked to some legislators or staff assistants or talked to different agencies that there's this negative perception in franchising. And I just want some of those people to talk to franchise owners. I mean, and not just the ones like, there's always gonna be people who complain, but talk to people who aren't complaining and to sure. understand like why it works. So to me, that's been, that's been surprising. It just feels like in the last couple of years, there's really been just an, a tremendous amount of negative sentiment. And, and you don't worry about the agency, whether it's a three letter agency or a four letter agency, like mm -hmm. they're out there and they don't have a, a particularly positive view of franchising. And um, to me, it's baffling because there are so many great success stories. Here, here's just an example. I was, I was at an SBA conference and I sat next to a gentleman who used to work for the SBA and he works over at a different agency now. Mm -hmm. And he just commented, he said, my boss has a target on franchising's back. And I said, oh, it, it's, it took me su by surprise. Um, right. This is a four letter agency. Um, and, and he said, yes, it's, it's actually was a topic of our conversation this morning. And I said, well, I just, I, can you help me understand? And he just started rattling off a laundry list of, of things that like the imbalance in the franchise or a franchisee relationship. And I'm like, imbalance, there are some franchisees that are bigger than their franchisors, right. um, you know, but, and, and so anyway, I, that, that has been a bit surprising to me. Yeah. It's been a never ending battle. I feel like every time a, a topic, you, it seems like it's put to bed. Joint employer, for example, is one I remember. This this was big like in 2008, 2009, if I remember. I'm sure it was big before then too. But I remember in 08, 09, it was like the topic. And then all of a sudden, now, of course, it's you know front and center now again. And yes, there was concessions made, it sounds like at one point, things were figured out. And now, of course, it's front and center again. Where do you think this joint employer thing in particular is going to shake out? I think it depends on whether there's going to be an administration change or not, because yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it really is a, a political uh, potato that people like to pick up and uh, and run with. And I think that's that's what we experienced is you had a change in administration and it was like, well, actually, we're going to go back to the way it was before. So it's just kind of kicking it back and forth. Yeah. So it's it's a good question. I don't, I do not have a crystal ball on this because of, of, I don't have a crystal ball on where, where we'll end up in the next election cycle. But I do think that there are enough industries. So the good news about joint employer is franchising is not alone, right? There's a lot of other industries that have a vested interest in uh, joint employer not being, uh, going down the path that it's currently headed. Mm -hmm. So Remains to be seen. I've asked many people the same question and they answer the same way too. No crystal ball, <laughs> we'll see. And maybe it'll be put somewhat to rest until another four or eight years from now and it'll it'll come up again, right? It just seems like it's a never it's a never ending battle. Franchisees sometimes don't understand like what it means. Like why did, why is joint employer an issue for me, right? Because they think, well, great, all the liability is going to be in the franchise. It's going to be the franchisor's problem. So, right. like, why wouldn't I be for joint employer? It the the ramifications of like what happens. It means that oh, you're not going to have as much support. Um, the system. If so, so there's two ways this could go down. The franchisee is not going to have the support that they need from the franchisor because they're concerned about joint employer. And so then you have uh, you might have system standard issues where now the value of your business now goes down right. because 
the not everybody's playing by the same rules because the franchisor can't support or can't say that they should be doing certain things, right? So you've just decreased the value of your business. The other alternative is the franchisor says, I'm not going to franchise. And so if you're not going to franchise, then who are you going to sell your business to? You have no marketplace to sell your business. And then the franchisor is going to be your only market. Supply demands. Okay. Right, right. So, so in either case, there's a lot of more issues, but I think the bottom line in both cases is your business going to be devalued. All right. Well, it remains to be seen. Positive note. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Edith, I, I've been, I've really been enjoying our conversation together and great seeing you again. Um, I, I want to ask you this. I, I always finish my podcast with, I call the tip jar because the franchise community, as you know, is so generous with sharing information with one another. So if I was an entrepreneur looking to franchise my concept, what would be a piece of advice that you would give me? Um, I love this idea of a tip jar. It's so visual. So I, I, I feel like I'd, I'd need to put a hundred dollar chip in there, not just look at 25 cents. <laughs> Go right ahead. But, um, my hundred dollar tip would be to talk to as many people as possible. So don't be sold just by one company or two companies telling you you should franchise your business. Mm. So find out what is it that you need to know. I think it's it's brilliant. There are some franchisors, um, I think it was Shelly son with Bright Star, like before she started franchising, she went to to franchise conferences. Mm -hmm. She read books. I mean, it was it was a very long process. Or if you start franchising, don't sign up too many franchisees before you really read, learn, talk to lots of people because there are many pitfalls in this relationship if you're not thinking the right way. Right. So, so if a franchisee calls you and your response is like, you know, like you're in the wrong business. Um, so, <laughs> or if you don't have many friends or, um, uh, or partners that have never been successful, like don't franchise. <laughs> Probably. Right. I, I agree with you. I, I always tell people that you are, you need to be a student of your industry. And, it, and obviously, the, the, you know, the learning never ends, but like I went to franchise conferences and franchise consultant, like, you know, dog and pony shows and read entrepreneur magazine, you know, back in the nineties. And I, I wanted to read everything I could about franchising before I dove in, because once that horse leaves the barn and you become a franchisor, that's it. It's a different, it, first of all, your business has changed forever, right? You're now in franchising, you're no longer in whatever business you were in, but yeah, I, I'm not surprised Shelly did that. She's a brilliant lady. She's done incredible, great work. And um, yeah, I think that's great advice. Thank you for asking me for my, uh, my tip. <laughs> Edith, thank you so much. Again, it was a pleasure seeing you again. I, I appreciate you being on the show. Appreciate you, Frank. Thank you for tuning into the Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast. For additional insights, guest applications, and to stay connected, visit us at efbpodcast.com. The Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast is for entertainment purposes only, and the views expressed do not necessarily represent those of Emerging Franchise Brands, its host Frank Fumi, or Emerging Franchise Group, LLC. Any discussed franchise or investment opportunity requires thorough investigation, obtaining proper disclosure documents, and expert consultation before making any investment decisions. The podcast and its host do not offer professional advice or endorsements, and they hold no responsibility for actions, representations, accuracy, or consequential damages related to the podcast content.